welcome to Black Light Mass Incarceration Show. I am your host, Sierra Cobb. Black Light Mass Incarceration Show is a space that is used to uplift the unheard voices of the criminal and social justice issues that many face today. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy. Sponsored by Emancipate NC. Welcome, Black Light listeners. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. First and foremost, I want to say thank you guys so much for all of your support and dedication. We have hit 2,000 downloads, and we've only been going, believe it or not, a year last week. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much because this would not be possible without you guys' support, liking, sharing, listening. Also, catch us on YouTube. We have a YouTube page now. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share to that. But thank you again. Thank you so much. I couldn't do this without you. I'm sure everybody that has been on here as a guest appreciate your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. So today, we are going to discuss, we're still on the abuse of power thing. That has not went anywhere. You know, I did receive an email back finally from DAC basically saying that they don't see abuse of power and they supposedly investigated but didn't find any of the claims that I stated to be accurate. So, of course, I sent back an email and, you know, explained the disgrace and disheartment of them not using the evidence that I have provided, which was about eight or nine statements from different people across DAC who are incarcerated, who have experienced abuse of power, especially at Warren Correctional. I know it's everywhere else, but Warren Correctional has been on my radar because they seem to be doing it a lot more than anybody else. And so, you know, we're still going to be stuck on that until we can get DAC to hold their staff accountable and come up with some implementations and programs that can hold their staff accountable instead of them always taking up for the things that they do. So, like I said, I sent the email, got an email back finally, and then I had to send another email basically explaining why everything he said in his email was not correct and that they did not do an accurate and intensive investigation on abuse of power. But so today I want to talk about Norway again, because I love Norway. I love how they understand that punitive punishment is not accurate, that punitive punishment does not get down to the root cause of why people are committing crimes, if they are committing crimes, and how they handle mental health. Because the United States, and especially the prisons in the United States, do not know how to handle mental health at all. And so they feel like they could put people in solitary confinement and that they can beat them to death. That will solve the mental health issue, and that's far from it. America in itself doesn't understand mental health. That's why we have so many shootings every day, because we don't understand how to holistically heal people's mental health. We feel like, um, you know, sending them to a psychiatrist and then sending them to a counselor and putting them on all different kinds of pharmaceutical medicines will automatically take care of all of their mental health situations and that's not true and we also don't understand that mental health is under-resourced just like it is in other places and that insurance is another big problem when it comes to mental health and so I just want to talk about Norway and how they have handled their mental health situations in prison because in America prisons have become literally the psych ward And so we have to do better, as I always say. If you know better, you do better. But we know DAC knows better. They're just not doing better. But anyway, Norway has gained international recognition for its progressive approach towards mental health in prisons. The country has implemented a range of initiatives and programs to support the mental health well-being of incarcerated individuals, prioritizing rehabilitation and reintegration. Norway has spent $129,000 per prisoner in 2018 compared to the $38,000 spent per incarcerated person in the United States. According to their 
respective government agencies, federal prisons averaged 36,000 in 2017, the latest year available according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Norway spends more in part because the cost of living is higher than the United States, but critics contend that the United States spends more in the long run overall because of the long sentences that people tend to have um, and are more likely to return back to prison. One key aspect in Norway's prison mental health strategies is the focus on prevention. The goal is to identify and address mental health issues as early as possible to prevent escalation. Upon entering the prison system, all incarcerated individuals undergo a comprehensive mental health assessment to determine their individual needs. Something that we do not do over here in America. We do not require everybody to go under a comprehensive mental health assessment. And that's really important. And I think that was something that I had spoke to the commissioner about was making sure that we are giving them comprehensive evaluations and assessments when they're coming in. It needs to start in jail. And if it's not happening in jail, then of course it needs to go over to the prison. And so I am currently working on mental health in all aspects. I'm working on mental health in the autism world. I'm working on mental health in the communities. And I'm also working on mental health in the prisons because I am sick of hearing about people getting stabbed all the time, people out to kill each other. Prison in America is like a zoo, y'all. It's, it's so many different cultures. It's so many different attitudes. Um, it's so many different backgrounds of living. And so when you cram all that into one living space, it gets really hectic. And so in order to make it safe for everybody, including staff, we have to take mental health more seriously than we do. They have a first responders unit in Norway. This is a stark difference is how United States and the Norwegian officials approach mental health issues can be seen. A coastal city in the southwest Norway where mental health ambulance responds to calls related to mental health issues. So they have a mental health ambulance that responds to any mental health issue, including in prison. Workers manage stands in a light field corridor at the Herald Prison in Norway where the incarcerated live in dorms, dorm-like rooms, in three buildings of the campus filled with trees. So the whole scenery is, is different. Like the dorms are room-like. They're not, on, you know, you're not in a bunk, in an open bunk space. You're not in a single cell with a metal door. You are in a comfortable living space. And that's extremely important. I don't know why America feels like everybody should be in this warehouse type of building with straight metal and concrete. Like that's, imagine that for your mental health. That, that For one, that's not good for your mental health. And two, it takes away from being able to heal. You know what I'm saying? So they actually had some workers that commented on just the way that they do things. And so the staff on hall runs by three psychiatrists, nurses, and a driver with mental health training. They are skilled at calming distraught patients. If police are also on the scene, mental health professionals take the lead. As in the United States, Norway has shuttered many of its mental health institutions, but it has more than three times as many mental health hospitals per bed 100,000 residents as the United States. Mental health consumed 12% of Norway's total health spending, while 7% of the U.S. healthcare dollars were spent on mental health, according to the OED. Mental health care is provided by Norway's socialized healthcare system, and the country has a well-developed infrastructure for delivering mental health care. The United States relies on more private health care insurance, and government programs for the poor and seniors and the subsidized insurance. By contrast, Norway views the primary purpose of incarceration as a successful return to the community, not a punishment. Let, let me reread that again. 
By contrast, Norway views the primary purpose of incarceration as a successful return to the community and not punishment, something America does not understand. The sentence is not the whole picture, says Jane, a deputy warden at the Herald Prison. It describes what they have done, but it does not define them as a person. They are their own, they are more than their criminal acts. Let me read it again. The sentence is not the whole picture, says Deputy Warden of the Herald Prison. It describes what they have done, but does not define them as a person. They are more than their criminal acts. Man, imagine what the United States could be if the staff of DOC, DAC understood that the sentence is not the whole picture. It's healing that person and that their criminal acts does not define them as a person. In America, your criminal act defines you. You are labeled for life, whether you committed that crime or not. In America, you are labeled, you are canceled, you are a felon, you are this, you are that. And in Norway, they don't do that. They don't put labels on people and they don't cancel people because they made a mistake. In Norway, the responsibility for mental health care in prisons lies with the Norwegian Correctional Services. They employ a multidisciplinary team of mental health professionals, including psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses, and social workers. Something that is not in America's prison. You might have one psychologist that has, or a counselor that might have to see maybe 100 or 200 people. Like, make it make sense. This is what I say when I say that we have to get on the budget. We have to make sure that they are taking our tax paying dollars, because that's what it is and that's what it's always going to be, and that they are investing it into making sure they are keeping our people whole. Not destroying our people, but keeping them whole. Which includes making sure you have a multidisciplinary mental health team. Something we don't have. And I don't understand why we don't have it when we're supposed to be the land of the free. We're supposed to be, you come here and you live your American dream. But yet and still, that's not what's going on here. That's definitely not what's going on at all here. Prisons in Norway also prioritize creating a therapeutic environment. You hear that, guys? A therapeutic environment. The physical design of the facilities is aimed at promoting mental well-being with ample light, open spaces, and access to nature. Incarcerated individuals are encouraged to engage in various therapeutic activities, including art therapy, music therapy, and outdoor recreation. None of that happens over here in America at all. Another important aspect of Norway's approach is to emphasize on continuing of care. So they don't just, when you get out of prison, they don't just say, all right, well, you're on your own. They have cultivated relationships with inside the community and have relationships with organizations inside the community so that they, when the person is released, they can continue to receive the exact same care that they received while they were incarcerated. In America, a lot of people go to prison and jail so they can get some type of medication, so they can get some type of help. And then when they're let out, they're back on the street with no health care, and then they are back into that mental health cycle that had got them in prison or jail in the first place. We just leave our people to defend themselves in America. People always wanted to make it seem like America was a great country and it's not. Like when you pull off the blind mask and you really see what's going on over here, it is not a great country at all. Like we don't treat our people the way that we're supposed to. It's only a certain class that gets what they need. As you see, we have a two-tier justice system in America where if you got money, you can get off, you can pay lawyers and judges, and you can get off. If you don't have money, then you're going to prison, point blank, period, whether you committed the crime or not. Another important aspect of Norway's approach is to emphasize the continual care. The mental health support provided in prisons is intended to continue beyond an individual's release. 
Transition planning begins early in the city. So they don't wait till, you know, you're in minimum custody to try to come up with a plan of how you're going to continue your mental health services when you're let go. They start in the early stages of your sentence. So say you got 10 years, they probably start in the first three or four years to figure out the plan that you're going to have when you're let go so that you can be a productive citizen in your community with the focus of connecting incarcerated individuals with community-based mental health services and support networks upon their release. That is something that I am currently working on, how to have more community-based services, mental health services, that will be able to serve the people that are coming home. I myself have a nonprofit, and I am, that's what I will be offering. I will be offering holistic mental health services that will help regulate your mental health, that will help reshape how you think, it will reshape how you respond so that when stressful situations come up, you are responding in a way that your brain is able to process, first of all, process what's going on. Secondly, your body is able to process what's going on. And third, you are able to respond in a manner that doesn't get you incarcerated, that, that, that does not take somebody else's life, okay? And I hear that a lot in prison that people can't even sit there and uh, agree to disagree without wanting to kill one another because they don't agree with them. Why? Because we can't teach them how to agree and disagree and have a conversation and not take it to the point of feeling like you want to kill that, that person because they don't agree with you. Furthermore, Norway recognizes the importance of collaboration between different stakeholders in the criminal justice and mental health system. Something we haven't done at all. I'm working on it, but I can't be the only one that works on it. This has to be a community-based thing. Like the community has to come together and understand that we have to do better by mental health. And if we do better by our people and their mental health, and make sure they have resources, then we won't have as much crime. The Norwegian Correctional Services work, with, work in partnership with local healthcare providers, government agencies, and community organizations to ensure a holistic, as I just said before, approach to mental health in prison. That is why I said again, me and my husband have a nonprofit that will offer holistic mental health approach, not only in the prisons, but also in the community. And this is something that we're working very hard on to hopefully get implemented inside of North Carolina DAC to see how well our mental health program can help people be better people. The hilly 75 acre site located south of Onslow is surrounded by a mile long steel and concrete wall, while America's prisons typically are stripped of vegetation due to security concerns and grounds at the Harlan mirror, the surrounding forest landscape. So they give them a for forest-like landscape because I don't think people understand that just being out in nature and being able to see the color of the trees and breathe in that fresh oxygen does so much for your brain and your body. Breathing in, taking deep breaths of fresh air literally gives your brain the fresh oxygen it needs to continue to work. And when you have fresh oxygen and your brain is receiving that fresh oxygen and you are breathing in slowly and breathing out slowly, it is literally, for one, taking away your stress. Two, it calms your nervous system down. And three, your brain stays online. When your brain goes offline due to stress, depression, or trauma, that is when you cannot no longer make a conscious decision. Your decisions are unconscious, and therefore it leads to anger, violence, and killing people. So if we could keep our brains online when we're going through stressful situations, imagine how many people would be in a better place. Incarcerated people walk freely along the asphalt paths lined with birch, 
pine and fruit trees to attend school and vocational programs like culinary arts and auto mechanics. Incarcerated individuals are given an allowance to buy food from prison stores, which is stocked with fresh fruits, vegetables, meats, and other groceries. Not the processed food that they are giving our people here because they want to do a contract with Airmark or Secure Pack or Union Supply. They are making sure that, that they are getting fed nutritional food, not all the processed food that you have in America and that you pay out the wooza for. Because another thing for your mental health is actually eating properly. When you consume a bunch of preservatives, it not only messes with your body, but it messes with your mind. Humans aren't meant to consume preservatives. But here in America, they love to put preservatives in our food to keep us what? Going back and forth to the doctor. The rest, they cook for themselves or others in the unit. So they're able to cook for each other. They have knives. They have a whole kitchen that they can cook in and they don't have to worry about people getting stabbed or anything of that nature because they have worked on the mental health. So they're able to make conscious decisions and not act out. Incarcerated individuals live in dorm-like rooms, as we stated before. Each room has a large safety glass window for view of the park-like outdoors. Did y'all hear that? Each room has a large safety glass window for a park view-like outdoors, as well as a comfortable bed, desk, and mini refrigerator, and a private bathroom with a shower. So what I like over here where you lay on like a what inch thick mattress and a pillow if you have one. They also have a desk and a mini refrigerator for you to keep your food cold and private bathrooms with a shower. So you don't have to go in there and be in a shower with a bunch of different men or a bunch of different women. You have your own private bathroom. It's just like as if you were at home. In Norway, they understand being incarcerated from your family is enough punishment. They don't add all the extra that they do over here in America where they want to dehumanize you or when they have search and seizures, they'll have a certain team. Here, I think it's the perk team that comes in and strip you naked in front of everybody, which I've heard, just to search you. Like, I don't think y'all understand that that's sexual harassment when you are making people strip down butt naked in front of people to search them. I don't even think they have searches like that over there in Norway because they know that's dehumanizing. It's not humanizing at all. So I don't understand why the prison thinks it's cool to strip search people and they don't do that in Norway at all. To me, it's, it's sexual harassment, just like it would be if you did it to somebody on the street. What makes it different because it's in prison? None. They can control their own lights. They have closed doors. You should be able to go in your bathroom without everyone watching you. And that statement is from somebody that works in a prison in Norway. You see, you see how they understand? They understand that you deserve privacy, not having to go in a bathroom with a bunch of men and shower in front of a bunch of men or worry about correctional officers coming in and trying to see you. You have your own private bathroom, so you don't have to worry about any of that. There are no armed guards at Harlem. Though tear gas and weapons are locked away if they're needed, there is about 290 guards, administrators, and other full-time personnel for 260 incarcerated individuals, plus 50 or so psychologists, nurses, and other specialists imported from the surrounding communities. The deputy warden at Harlan Prison in Norway says his country's correctional system is focused on normality and human. This is from a deputy warden, and they say that their country's correctional system is focused on normality and human treatment. Humane treatment. I want y'all to understand that. That is what it should be about, treating people with humanity and dignity. We don't understand that over here, and we wonder why prison is so dangerous. Because you're not treating people like they're humans. You're treating them as if they're animals. Check this comment out. The best weapon we're armed with is our mouth and the ability to communicate. 
said the deputy warden. Most situations are solved with communication. Prison guards eat meals, play games, and socialize with the people incarcerated. How about that? The most situations are solved with communication. And they don't, their correctional officers don't look at them as if, oh, well, you committed this crime, you are the worst of the worst, or just talk to them any kind of way. They eat meals with them, they play games, they socialize. Those three things by itself can give somebody who don't have family on the outside to support them hope. It gives them support. And you know what that means? That means that their population is calm. They're not, it's not like a zoo over there like it is here. The goal is to develop relationships and build trust. It is a part of the dynamic security practice at Carolyn. If you disrespect them, the incarcerator will, will not sit down with the guard to discuss their future or how to reunite with their children. They understand. They understand to the T. Because here, the staff loves to disrespect people. They love to provoke people. And then when the incarcerated come after them, they want to make it seem like, oh, well, we can't keep them safe and their animals and whatever else crazy thing that they think over here. They don't understand that to get respect, you have to give respect. And they don't want to give them respect. And that goes back to the training. Whatever kind of training that they give over here is horrible. They need to send every correctional officer, every administrator, every warden, they need to visit Norway. And to understand how Norway has had this system in place for over 19 centuries, that they've been doing this humanization in their prison. And they have not backed away because they know that that is what helps their community. They are about making sure that when the incarcerated person goes back to the community, they are happy, healthy, and whole. America, they're going to tear you down. You're not going to be the same person you were when you went in. And they're going to make sure that you don't have any type of resources when you come home because you're labeled a felon over here. So let's talk about the security since America makes it seem like they don't know how to keep a prison secure without treating them inhumane. There is little violence at Harlan compared to the U.S. prisons. The chief of psychiatry said he hears of a prisoner on prisoner assault perhaps every other third month, usually a shove or a push, not deadly. You see what I'm saying? Either a shove or a push, not where you got people jumping you or you got four or five people stabbing you to death. Why? Because they know how to treat the people incarcerated. Why? Because they give them actual holistic mental health. That's why they don't have a violent prison. And they've been doing this for years, as they say, compared to the U.S. Ask about sexual assault. I have never heard about that during my three years. And this is a correctional officer that works in the Norway prison. Unlike America, you have people being sexually assaulted by staff all the time. All the time that goes out of the radar. Over there, they don't have that. Each incarcerated has a contact officer who acts as a case manager and an advisor. They meet with them weekly to talk about how things are going. So they're involved. They're in, they interact with the incarcerated. So they don't just, you don't just see your case manager and talk about what programs you can take or what you need to do to get the minimum or medium. They talk to them about how everything is going while they're incarcerated. Totally different. Chief Mary, director of kitchens at Harlem Prison in Norway, incarcerated or allowed to use knives and prepare gourmet meals for dinners at the prison's restaurant. They have a restaurant in their prison, y'all, and they have knives. Believable. So they have a progressive model. The incarcerated at Harlan progress through a program of ever-increasing trust, responsibility, and opportunity. In the kitchen that, ha that houses Harlan Culinary Arts Program, utensils including an assortment of knives are hanging on the wall. In the carpentry shop, where Thomas was convicted of a drug crime, works with hammers, drills, circular saws, and other tools. 
he said it looks he looks forward to taking the daddy in prison course and prerequisites to extend family visits. Not only did they let them have a whole restaurant kitchen in their prison, they also have a program that helps them be able to have extended family visits. Unlike here, unlike North Carolina, where some prisons only want you to have an hour with your loved one, or where if you hug them too long, they want you to back up, or they don't have anything that's family or kid-friendly in the prisons. I think they're trying to do that now. But they need to understand that family contact is extremely important for somebody incarcerated. You have people here that have been incarcerated so long, they have literally lost all of their family members. All the family members have died off because they've been incarcerated that long. And they have basically no contact with them. You got people who have family members who stay out of state. You got people who have family members that stay on the other side of the state and it can take them four and five hours for a one hour visit. Like, let's be real here. Taking everything away from somebody incarcerated is not going to make them a better person. It is not going to make them realize what they done if they did do it was wrong. It's going to make them worse. John Adams, 65, works in a textile shop at Harlem Prison in Norway. Products produced in the prison's textile studio, print shops and art shops, wood shops, and other learning centers can be purchased online, and then they have a website. But I guarantee you they're not paying them pennies. I guarantee you that everything that they sell goes right back into that prison and goes right back into the people that's incarcerated in that prison, unlike America where they make millions of dollars off correctional enterprise and paying them pennies. Another thing, if you would pay them a decent wage, you probably wouldn't have to worry about the oppression on top of oppression in prison. Because when you don't have family support and you're not making any money to feed yourself or buy shoes or anything that you need, like toiletries, that's when the oppression comes. So then you start oppressing other people because you see they have support and you want what they have. So if we was to pay them a living wage, that can cut that down tremendously. That can make the staff safe. That can make the prison safe. But no, we don't understand that. We just want to make money off of body autonomy and get free labor off of people like we did back in the slavery days. Because that's what we live on. We live off of making money off of other people's body autonomy. We don't understand that your community, if everybody is working and thriving, that your community can keep your economy boosted. We don't understand it over here. Then, as he said, I'll be able to have overnight visits in an apartment every three months. So just by taking the daddy in prison course, he will be able to have overnight visits with his family once every three months. Now, and it's in a cottage-like apartment. And they do have prison guards there, and but they're together all night. You see what I'm saying? They're not in a prison type of ring, they're in an apartment. Only what six states allow conjugal visits, California, Maine, New York, it's two or three more that I'm missing. They are the only ones in the United States that offer conjugal visits or visits with the family visits. They understand that family contact is really important. Really important it is, y'all. So why can't we implement the things that Norway has done. Seeing that Norway has been very successful with recidivism rates, they've been very successful in the mental health aspect, they've been very successful in keeping their prisons safe, they've been very successful in retaining staff. So I read an article this morning that was published by NC Newsline, and it was talking about Scotland Correctional, which is a horrible prison. It's overcrowded. The staff is nasty, just like majority of the prisons in North Carolina. Most of the prisons have nasty staff. And they even got a comment from somebody who works at DAC. And of course, they didn't want to say their names because of what? Abuse of power and being retaliated on for speaking about your work environment. So not only are you retaliated on in prison because you are incarcerated, but if you work in a prison and you don't agree 
with how they're treating the incarcerated, you have the chance of being retaliated on because they feel like you're not on their side. And the comment that was made from whoever at DAC was disgusting. For you to say that you're not going to entertain anonymous allegations is wrong. This is why I have been so hard on abuse of power, because y'all have to understand that you have to sit down and listen to your staff and you wonder why you're short staff. You wonder why you're short staff when you make comments like that. Todd Ishii, you are the secretary. That is disgusting for somebody to say because the staff does not feel safe at all. That is why you all are short staffed. That is why America will continue to be short staffed in prison until they change their culture because the culture is nasty. People do not want to work in that culture. All this stuff you got going on now is 2024. People are not going to bow down to the nastiness that goes on inside a DAC. This is why it's important that you look at the abuse of power within your staff and the ones that are causing trouble, you hold them accountable so that you can keep staff, so that staff can feel safe about voicing their opinion when they don't agree with what is going on. S somebody, am I wrong? If I'm wrong, somebody tell me I'm wrong, but I, I don't think I'm wrong because I didn't understand that comment. That comment was ignorant. Your staff should be able to voice their opinion and feel safe and not hear you say, oh, I'm not going, I'm not going to entertain false anonymous allegations. Yeah, because they can't come to you directly and say, hey, A, B, and C is going on and, and actually you take it seriously and take care of it. No, you're not. You're going to just push it out of the rug like you did with my abuse of power claim. Disgusting. That's why you're going to forever be short staff. That's why there has to be a different solution because what y'all have been doing for the last past 400 years has not worked and it's not going to work. There is too much going on. People out here working too many jobs, trying to take care of their family to have to go to work and deal with nonsense at work. Okay. Eventually, incarcerated are allowed short trips outside the prison, accompanied by two guards. When they're ready, they can leave on their own for a few hours, more than 99% return from their furlough on time according to the Norwegian Correctional Services. Then they'll be transferred to an open prison, a halfway house where they can work and attend school under intense supervision, a impossibility for America, which forbids early release. Now, I, now here in minimum custody, once you get down to that, you can get like a 24-hour pass where you can leave and then come back. But that's only when you get to minimum custody, which means that means you only have a few more years left on your sentence that you can come home. So they'll allow that then. Other than that, they don't allow that at all. About 80% of Norwegian incarcerated individuals suffer from mental health issues or learning disabilities. Carolyn's prison, the deputy warden says, but a focus on normality and human treatment leads to improvement for many incarcerated. Talk to them with respect, keep them in activities, and lower the aggression and tension, and most mental health issues will be resolved. You hear that? Talk to them, respect them, keep them in activities, and lower the aggression and tension, and most mental health issues can be resolved, just like that. The results of Norway's approach to prison mental health have been encouraging. Studies have shown that the country's recidivism rates are significantly lower compared to other countries, indicating the effectiveness of their rehabilitation focused approach. By prioritizing mental health, Norway aims not only to improve well being of incarcerated individuals, but also reduce reoffending rates and promote successful reintegration back into society. The 250 million Carolyn prison, which opened in 2010, was designed to mimic life in a normal village. There are no steel bars, razor wires, or watchtowers, though it's a maximum security facility housing murderers, rapes, child molesters, and other dangerous criminals. And this is a maximum security prison, y'all. See, that's what I'm saying. That is exactly why I keep talking about Norway and their model, because this is how it should be everywhere. 
I had a friend that I was talking to the other night who watched America's Tough, well, not America, but UK's Toughest Prisons. And she said even in UK, the um, maximum facilities, they're still able to walk around. They're still able to have family contact. It's nothing like here where you're always in solitary confinement. They don't even use solitary confinement at all over there across seas. Unlike America. America lives and breathes in solitary confinement thinking that is going to change somebody's behavior when indeed it makes their behavior worse. We have data after data, studies after studies showing how solitary confinement literally changes the brain function. It literally can shrink your brain from being isolated so long, not having light, being in a parking lot, literally a four by six cell every day, 22 hours out the day. The only time you come out is to take a shower or when they give you rec time inside of a dog cage. Okay. So this is why you will hear me and always hear me say, Norway understands. And for any prison in America to be successful and to make sure that when they are releasing people, that they are coming back healthy, happy, and whole, is to integrate all of the plans that Norway has done. I'm not understanding what's taking so long. I'm not understanding why, and I know many of DAC workers have been to Norway. Like you have regular people going over there to Norway to see how their prisons are because that is just how wonderful it is. The culture is magnificent. They don't have a problem with short staff in Norway. They actually have a problem with putting people on the wait list to work in Norway's prisons because why? Because the culture is safe, it's secure, it's happy, it's whole. You're not only tearing down the people incarcerated, but you're also tearing down your staff. And staff is no longer over here wants to deal with that. That's why you have United States shortage of staff in prisons and jails. They don't want to continue to treat people as if they're nothing. And for the up, that higher ups not to understand that by now, I don't get it. If I had short staff prison, I would do everything in my power to make sure that my staff is happy, healthy, and whole, and that the people that my staff is watching is the same way. Because I know that my environment is a comfortable environment. It's a safe environment. People need to feel safe. When people don't feel safe, that's when you have aggression, tension, and everything else that comes with not feeling safe. So y'all, I have an interview coming up with Teron, who has been a guest on Black Light several times. And he talks about abuse of power that he experiences, DAC claims that abuse of power doesn't happen. He also wrote a statement as well about the abuse of power that he experienced at Warren, which was another statement that I had provided to DAC. And so I want you to listen to his story and absorb his story in. And in tune, I need for y'all to continue to be on Taishi's tale about the abuse of power and working with community organizations to help come up with implementations that can hold staff accountable when staff is being nasty. It's all about accountability. You can't hold people incarcerated accountable, but then when somebody is complaining about your staff, you want to put a blindfold on and act like you don't see what's going on. Because it's a pack thing. It's not about making sure that everybody is safe and is in a good middle space. It's about a pack because DAC is a pack. They look out for one another. They don't care who is wrong. They will take up for one another like no other. And it's wrong. It's not going to change anything or solve anything until you open your eyes, take the blinders off, and sit down with community organizers and the community in itself and people that have been incarcerated and even those that are incarcerated. Talk to them. I don't never hear that Todd Ishii has went and talked to somebody incarcerated unless it's at the seminary graduation. He doesn't go to the prison and go talk to the people in the dorms and be like, hey, how is my staff treating you? No, he wants to go and greet the staff. He don't want to get the stories from the people that's actually in there. Because let me remind you, there's a lot of people incarcerated in North Carolina who have not committed a crime. Say that again. There are many people incarcerated who have not committed a crime. 
but they are subjected to the nasty culture in prison because of modern day slavery. Slavery, modern day slavery, whatever you want to call it, it's still slavery. So, y'all, stay on it. You got to stand up for something. Keep fighting. They might knock you down, but you get back up and you fight harder. Because if you're not helping to ease the problem, then you are the problem. And we don't need no more problems. We got enough problems in America today. We need more solutions. Not problems, but solutions. Because we are in a tailspin. And it is very ugly out here, y'all. So please, get involved. Get involved in the organizations. If you need to learn, need to learn how to advocate for your loved one, reach out to me. Black Light is currently trying to explore more options to keep the audience engaged. We're trying to do more things so that y'all can reach out. If you need me, I'm here to help you advocate for your loved one. I'm here to show you the ropes, how to advocate for your loved one to ensure that they are a better person and they're happy and healthy and whole when they come home. You can always find me on any social media. You can reach out to me through my email at Sierra, C-I-E-R-R-A, at emancipatenc.org. You can reach out to me on Blacklight. It's blacklight at emancipatenc.org. I'm here, y'all. I'm here to help you advocate. I'm here to help you to help other people. Because if we keep letting our prisons tear down our communities, we ain't gonna have no communities. I keep saying this, and I've said to, I don't know how many people in the past week, we are now warehousing babies, young, middle, and elderly people. So you literally have whole communities in prison. And it's not going to stop until we make them stop. We have to get behind these prosecutors who are just throwing people in prison and jails and they don't have sufficient beyond a reasonable doubt evidence. We have to get behind these judges to ensure that they are making sure that the prosecutors are following the rules. We have to get behind these public defenders and help them out because they have no help and the states don't want to fund them at all. That's why you need advocates. You need advocates pre-trial. You need advocates post-trial to ensure that everybody is getting a fair trial, to ensure that everybody is being treated fairly and with humanity and dignity inside of prison. I'm here, y'all. If y'all need me, reach out. If you want to be on the show, reach out. Thank you so much, y'all, for just all of the support that you have given Black Light since we have started last September. I can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Continue to support. Continue to band together and fight this injustice system that we have in America because it's not a just system. It's not about bringing justice. It's about, let's see how many people we can incarcerate to get free money, to get free labor. That's what it's about here. And so us as community members can change that narrative if we do it in numbers because people are power numbers are power so y'all until the next episode take care stay safe always remember to uh meditate take deep breaths go out in nature and do some mindfulness y'all i'm out take care Welcome to the Black Light fam. I got a special guest once again. I got Teron back with us. You want to spread some information about some things that's going on in the prison. Teron, go ahead and tell us what's going on. I think the main thing I, I want to talk about administration power. Because you want it warm, it's pretty warm. You got the water, it's the hockey, and surely fit. They do things like confidential employers, but bad and Punish people over here. They're not damn good. They got good deep talents for like deep process and stuff like that. And I myself have been bust back from that camp and I have witnessed. I don't know how many guys get bust back on the charts of 899 and with a confidence in front of it. And it'll never have any evidence or nothing. And when I was there, I stayed down with a doctor all the time. I participated in all the programs. I was part of a little band, played music, song, and everything. And I had a barge up the whole time I was there. 
never had no write up. And I got that the charge for a college employment. And I went to the DHO. The DHO found me guilty. He said, because the war can write you up. You're not going to be the, you're not going to be the write up. And uh, so I didn't have a, I didn't have an important hearing. I probably be there for that the fourth year. I didn't have an important hearing. And I, I now, the same way I got so guilty, they bust me back to close custody. And I wrote my appeal, got beat. And the charge got dismissed. But I still got to close custody. You know, I think the issue that I had with that this way, because it took me, I feel like 20 years, it took me 18 years to avoid the, 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 the write up and the gap and the shore or whatever you want to call it. He would stay out of trouble. He get my media custody. And my, my media custody wasn't just no a year time or 90 day period. No, it took me, we go like five years of motion. Then I was struggling, getting that clean, working to get to that level to get me infected. Then for me to get just back for no reason. If I did something, I could wear it. But when I didn't do anything, and you're using a blanket challenge and the confidence to inform it, that is not right. You get one it to a lot of people there, you know, and it's, 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 it's more than it, 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 like, a lot of the staff here, they don't think that what he's doing is not right, but he's their boss, so there's nothing that they can do about it. So it's being over their head, so the only avenue that we have is to go out of the treadmill, like what we're trying to do. But it seems like uh, some of the guys are being like, in my team, political presence, when we speak on their fire catch, and like, everybody that was there to talk on their fire trailers, gosh, like that from there. You know, they bought this, you used to work on the podcast and stuff like that, and you used to, to bust the bank. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, the story, like I say, every day the open system, if somebody does a thorough investigation, go and look, I can just think about myself for the past year, how many people, the war is alone that's written up at this prison. The TV, the Pizza Rising, the Shirley Gang, they have. We had letters between the two of them, then the only staff that warrant is on um, day shift and night shift. They're the only one to be perfect. Every time they lost somebody, they would never catch nobody with anything. It's like, let's say you get to a point of time, a strong case down for it. They ain't got no evidence. You know what I'm saying? So let me ask you this. I want you to explain to the audience how being bust back when you work so hard to either get mediums or minimums, how being able, how how it affects you being bust back when you have worked so hard to get where you were at? It changes, for me, for me personally, it changes the whole trajectory of what I got going on. Meaning that, okay, I got a head in a patrol in court on a game, not finish over time because I'm not even supposed to get crazy. Yeah, but that's another topic. But you know, that, when I've been to the court, they look at it, what I'm at, the shit I'm ready to transition back into the body. Okay, when we're gonna have media country, it's saying like a little counter to stay out of trouble and do anything. And when you're in media country, you have more privilege. Only you have more privilege for me, I was close to home, that was my home kept. I was only like 15 to 20 minutes from home, I can get my bed and, and stuff like that. And, and I'm like, you know, the game thing, like FRD thing, that's another thing, like being sorry, and you can get some great time, but there, when you, when you have those things, it's like so, it messes up everything because it'll tell you on this year, I'll wait a whole nother year before you aim to be brought back up for review again. Okay, well, I have the definitely need, need to be, it was another year brought up for review, sorry, or it did, or whatever it may be, or I got left back like this. Messages you want. If the person is down in the world, and you want to throw them out to get these promotions because that's what they're called. And you become like the manager of a company, and all of a sudden, from your life, the manager of their company, from the life of the manager of their company, and it's like, okay, I got to look for those white, or get a from the community that pay. You have to move from the out. When you get left, you got to get like, whoops. You got going on. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's the thing. Like, once you get to this thing and you start working, the earning thing 
And when they said, okay, well, now we're going to book you back. You know what I'm saying? It's like, wow, booking me back. It's like a, it's a first in itself. You know what I'm saying? Bro. Hey, you said you beat your charge, right? Yes, I did. My charge got to admit the army of the night. So that means that was a false charge and they had no evidence to back up the write-up that she gave him. And so this is something that has been continuously going on. I actually just did a podcast episode last week about the abuse of power. I have reached out to Todd Nishi and the Commissioner Brandy about this issue with what's going on at Warren, at Warren and have not heard anything back. And so I've actually been hearing that a lot of other people have wrote statements, which I have the statements stating that she has done that to them because she didn't like them or because their family was calling and complaining or because they came in the podcast and spoke out about it. And that's what I feel. I feel for that. Like a lot of guys, they got let back with guys who had been on this podcast. Like me, you ever heard of that? I never heard of someone right up there. Like a scene. I had a dog the whole time there. I was getting signed up for a uh, a UNC, a college court, so getting ready to have, because you know, he tried to have more education and chose custody to have more like better education of stuff, like trade and stuff that you pick up, stuff you can get for like your associate or what's more like your bachelor's or associate degree. And I was trying to get you clear program to get the education for the social day. But now that I got blood back, it took me away from there and it just reset everything that I can get on his lick, I can get on the lick, like, okay. It might be however many people on the list. You might be never set me by. And now you get brought back. Your name is no longer being touched. Now you got to start that globe. Now when you get back, you might be with 300. You know what I'm saying? So it's not right to keep resetting you. You like to say, if it's something that we done or something we got caught now, okay, no problem to me. But I feel like if I can show and prove that I didn't do anything to get funny and it's hard to get reversed, you should adhere to the same policy that you're using to the party to me. You that policy to burn everything as so they're not doing it. Not doing it. No, they're not. And so tell me about what happened with your custody, because you said that since you beat your charge, you were supposed to be able to go back to medium custody, but what happened? They left me back on the same day. Then when I was there, uh, Ms. Collier was an affiliate coordinator for the like, motions and stuff like that. She started bringing me up. For one from getting on reaching because she said, because the child is trapped. So she said that Mrs. Hodges told her not to give me on reaching because she said, and then they gave you another 45 days, you know, for kids to be 45 days, you going to be on 60. I said, you know, like a little, a little, you know, they gave you nothing which they were not supposed to do. So the thing that I got from to be but me that close to we're not giving on the mom or medium cut that it is to be here. And the best part of my case manager today, she told me that I have to wait a year. I have to wait a year for to come back up for another custody review. Even without a write up. But she can tell her sponsor from out it, see they can do about it, what they're gonna do. That's, so not, like, that's not right. They they ain't getting kind of yeah, I'm, I'm getting funny. I was talking to the case manager, and I'm like, okay, I'm getting funny. Yeah, here, I can't even, they tell me I can't get a job here. They tell me I can't get a job because I got to wait 90 days to get on a list and wait 90 days before I'm able to get a job here. Okay. So with that being said, that's why, okay, I see you make me wait 90 days to find a job when I was there. I didn't do anything to get my job. The way so when you take away my job, you're taking away my, you're taking away my, why like you buy me my due process? Because when you, when you do that kind of stuff, you take, you take me off my minimum on my date. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. So that yeah, affects a lot of stuff. Like my minimum, but okay, I got a time for you to my minimum at 2039. Okay, now I think it's all right. The right of this mental world is, I feel, you know, my date was already back to 2043. Yeah, and, and, and I didn't even get a writer, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, you got to let me do process, you know what I'm saying? Because you're sentencing me. You're sentencing me. So, how is that going to affect your family since, you know, you were close to home and now you are, what, like two hours away from home? 
over two hours away from home? Yeah. Yeah, I'm over two hours now. So now it's like, I'm about to have a stroke, okay? Mm. Well, my father had a stroke, it's like, so he getting close to high, it would be more reasonable to travel. I couldn't travel with him or whatever. It would be more, I guess, accessible to come travel to him short. Versus two hours in the car, because you don't know, want to greet. We went to the station where all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, now I'm so far away, I can just tell them, no, don't worry about it. You got to set up a, vid- a video visit. But a video visit is like here, it's like 15, 20 minutes or something like that. You know, it's 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Versus, you know, I have some visit, like, right? you know, contact, like the album. It changes the dynamic a lot because, you know, it's it, 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 it's a year to do this, but you gotta wait three years to do this. I'm like, okay, like, he's not against, I got, what do you call it? It's being hard, but it's like, we have 16 seconds remaining. It's just where it's saying, why it's for like, he created it, or the player is a group, that there's a group demonstration. And that's the kind of writers I got, you know what I'm saying? So, they guess you gotta wait five years to get overruled. And when I get it overruled, and stay out of trouble, and then I get there, then you send me, okay, and then you're gonna brush me back here with you. Yeah. And I had never seen a room, but you're not gonna go for your room, so your outer rooms will be great. You've got 30 seconds for me. There seems like there's no rules. It's their rules or no way. That's the way it always seems. It seems like they always put staff over the people incarcerated. Like staff don't do no wrong. And that's exactly how it is. That's exactly how it is. That's exactly how it is. And that's why it needs to be changed. Because, I mean, that takes people back. Like, that could really make somebody just act out and say, forget it. You know what I'm saying? When you're busting them back for no reason. Yeah, that's what I feel Mm -hmm. like. So thank you again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Your host, Sierra Cobb. Take care. 